Do you believe that there has to be pain and suffering in the world for us to understand love? Or do you believe that we can all heal and there could be a world where there's the, no addiction to suffering? I believe that it could be a world with no addiction to suffering. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on how to live your most authentic life, how to release suffering and unlearn the beliefs that hold you back through the teachings of Toltec wisdom. One of my favorite books of all time is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And it's a book I recommend to everybody. Hopefully you've heard of it because I recommend you read it. Grab a copy right now. But anyway, today's guest is the author's son who is continuing to share the spiritual wisdom. I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Don Jose Ruiz. Don Jose Ruiz is a Toltec master of transformation and modern day shaman. He is a direct descendant of the Toltecs of the Eagle Knight lineage and is the son of Don Miguel Ruiz, author of New York Times bestseller, The Four Agreements. He is the author of The Fifth Agreement and six other titles. Along with his family, he teaches workshops and offers transformational journeys around the world. Hello, Jose. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? Oh, very good and very grateful, Aileen, for this invitation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for being here. It's my honor. So why don't we start with laying the foundation? Because our listeners might not know anything about you or Toltec wisdom. What is Toltec? Like, tell us about your lineage and your experience growing up with your family. Well, first of all, Toltec, it is a tradition from a long time ago that my family came from. And it means in Nahuatl, artist of the spirit. And uh, and we're created to see everything as art, everything that we do in life as an art. So we can go back in time for the first Mexican in my family that uh, we can count. It's my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather that was living in uh, New Spain. And when the Mexico got independence, it became Mexico. So from that, he had a son called Don Leonardo. And then... He had a daughter called Madre Sarita, and then Madre Sarita, my grandmother, had my father, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, which is the author of The Four Agreements, and then he birthed uh, me and my brothers, and uh, Michael and me are the ones who do uh, write, continue writing books and things. So you're saying this wisdom was passed down all the way from, like, like that long ago? And then tell yes. us, okay, so, so what kind of beliefs did you learn early on? How did it shape your life? Because I think this, the wisdom that you share is so deep. Like, did you always grow up with this wisdom? It was just common sense from the beginning of, of my family. So it was a way of celebrating life. It was just a, a way of living the way that knowing that everything's a dream and whatever you want in your life, it, it can manifest. But of course, you know, being a teenager in the in the 80s and 90s, um, well, the pure pressure of life began happening. So one gets seduced by wanting to fit in with the friends and the neighborhood and, you know, and then wanting to be something that little by little, the core teachings are inside of us, but yet again, we get lost with life. And then later in time, um, when we decide to go back to the training is when we ask ourselves the question, is there more than life than this? And every generation that asks these questions to, you know, the elders, uh, they put a smile because that's a symbol that the training is about to begin. Uh-huh. So did your family expect you to become a spiritual person and also to teach? Or, or did they kind of let you do your thing? <laughs> well, they always let us do our thing. But deep inside in my heart, I always knew I, I was going to do this work because I always feel appealed. I mean, I, I was always feeling like, a, like towards this, this dream. And I remember being like nine or 10 years old when I was visiting my grandmother. So when my, my grandmother was a faith healer, so she did consultations all day. My mother used to assist her by translating. So I, on the weekends, I get along the ride. And then one day, um, my grandmother had me put my hands on one of her clients, one of her patients. And she said, just close your eyes. Don't think about anything. But just feel the transmission between your body and their body and send them the vibration that you would like to send. Well, anyways, when that was over... She asked me, what do you want to do with your life? And of course, I said, I want to be a healer like you and a messenger mm -hmm. like my father. And he, she put a smile and says, and what would you like to do this? Because we were in America, in San Diego at the time. And I said, I want to do it in Japan. And she got me off guard. Why Japan? It's because I will have a translator with me. 
and I have no idea to politely translate it. I'm just going to open from my heart and speak. Well, 20 years later, that actually helped. And I was in Japan and I transmitted this. But before I got to transmit that in Japan 20 years later, I had to go and unlearn many things, how I used to hurt Jose, how I picked those along the way as a teenager and a young adult to get to that position. So everything in life uh, happens for a purpose. But when we decided that we're going to do this journey, it's because our elders say, okay, they're going to enter the jungle. They may get lost in the jungle, but if they return, they're going to be able to share what we share and keep the family tradition alive. That's so beautiful. I know you have quite a story. I mean, tell us about your experience in your early 20s. Did you lost your eyesight? And what happened? And how did you navigate through that challenge? Well, uh, the thing that happened is in my in my youth, I, I became addicted to substance, to drugs and, and stuff like that. Um, and then when I got liberated from that and I began walking the path, I did a little damage in my eyes, but I didn't realize it. And when I got a, a root canal, Two years later, after I became sober, the nerve system got affected by the medicine that got triggered behind my eye and in front of my brain. So in that moment, it created like an inflammation and uh, it made damage to my eye that I lost my eyesight for almost two weeks. Mm. Anyways, those two weeks was when I realized that I couldn't see before. I only wanted to see what I wanted to see. And because of the life that I did before, and when I saw my mother crying, it gave me strength to say, Mom, I'm okay. And really, that gave me some strength to not feel sorry for myself, not to be victim after feeling frustration, of course, and desperation. Then I just surrendered to it. But there was something magical that happened is that in my dreams, I could see. So I had a course in, in, in a lucid dreaming. But when I woke up like two weeks later from a profound dream and I could see blurry, I walked up to the bathroom and I saw myself in the mirror and I saw my physical body like if it was a different, complete person. And I said, you know, this person that I see in the mirror every day, I'm seeing it once again. And it's always loyal to me. And that's when I asked myself this question, when I'm going to be starting being loyal to this person in front of me? And that's when I really understood the Totec tradition. And in the Totec tradition, there's nothing to learn but unlearn what takes our inspiration away to live life. So from that point on, I begin, you know, working on myself to let go of the addiction of suffering that I carry without knowing it. Because, you know, a young mind just picks up everything that it sees and tries to survive until they ask the question, is there more than life than this? And when we hit that point, especially when I hit that point after losing my eyesight, I said, you know, I really want to enjoy this dream. But before I do it, I have to unlearn and be honest in my own path. Yeah. Yeah. Since you're already talking about these these concepts, addiction to suffering and the Toltec wisdom, why don't you start from the beginning? How do you explain like the most important lesson in Toltec wisdom? Well, the first important lesson in the Toltec tradition is life and death. If you don't understand these concepts, any story, any illusion, any drama, any heartbreak will get you away from the truth. The moment that you know life and death, you know that everything begins and everything ends. And we're here to experience the most that we can consciously. So with this awareness, it's not about religion. It's not about searching. It's about surrendering that we have the, the, the strength to overcome anything in life and to deliver it to ourselves because no one is going to do so because no one knows what we think. Like, I know what makes me happy and I know what makes me suffer. And how do I know this? Because I am me. I can be honest with myself without creating lies and just tell myself the honest truth. And this is what many people are afraid to tell themselves, the honest truth, to know what's stopping them. Because, you know, in the addiction of suffering, we're programmed to live in a pain that we're used to, just get settled in a life that we don't make us have inspiration. But when we know that there's life and death, there's no time to waste. That's why many people who had that experience, they become enlightened and awakened because slap them on a big slap in the mm-hmm. face and they say, you're still alive. So they have the opportunity to enjoy each day of their life, no matter what's happening in the outside. Support for today's episode comes from Honey Love. 
Whether you are a bride, wedding guest, or simply seeking everyday smoothing, Honeylove is the go-to for all things shapewear. Honeylove has revolutionized compression technology so you no longer have to feel like you're suffocating while wearing effective shapewear. Honeylove's lingerie-inspired designs make you feel cute while using breathable fabric that keeps you nice and cool. Plus, you don't have to worry about it rolling down thanks to the flexible boning hidden in the side seams. I have the crossover bra and superpower brief. The bra is the most comfortable yet supportive wire-free bra I've tried and is also really flattering. Their superpower series are designed to sculpt and smooth without squeezing your natural curves. Trust that you'll get a boost of confidence wearing these. Treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash TLL. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off. It's honeylove.com slash TLL. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Shape your life with Honeylove. Can you explain more about how everybody's living in a dream? I think that's a concept some people don't understand at first. So how do you explain it? Just because there's so much investment in reality, in the real search, you know, I work eight years or 10 years in this company. So, you know, this company owes me things. You know, when we realize that nothing belongs to us, we don't owe anything. We can have things in the bank account, but when we go home, when we love the body, it's still going to be there. We don't take nothing with us. So what we begin seeing is the dream of the planet. And it's not the planet Earth dreaming is what the humanity has made of the planet Earth. And the humanity dreams from, let's say, 5,000 years ago that it created a language. And here's the thing. People believe that the language is truth instead of using it like a tool, like a vehicle to communicate to one another. They made the language the truth that in the Totec tradition, the language is the biggest illusion. Why? Because in the language creates stories and then with stories, you know, people can invent stories and manipulate by the word of suggestion that people stop thinking for themselves and they get rushed by the sea. And when I mean the sea, it's a dream of the planet's illusion that it takes them away from the reality. Let's say if somebody was told from a, a young age that they cannot sing, that they sing horribly, they will believe that story and they will make the character of their life into the person who cannot sing beautifully mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there is an inner judge. So this happens in all the world. The corruption of knowledge is the corruption of the word. That's why the first agreement of the four agreements is very powerful to be impeccable with your word because your word is the one that creates the story. But when you are aware that words create a story, then we enter the dream of the magician because words are magic. You can create divine magic or negative magic like break someone's heart, make ill intent to people because, you know, the suggestion of the word is so powerful and the power of the belief as well. But when we begin freeing ourselves from words and people begin judging us, you know, we know it's not truth. So that gives us advantage for an immune system for the sickness that is in the world. But first thing that we need to do is to respect our mind, our thinking mind, our temple, knowing that words come and go. They will try to hook you. And this is when I realized that I have a mission in my life is to protect myself from myself. Every day in life, every interaction that I have, and I do it in my own way. Because if I try to do it in someone else's way, I'm going to fail because I'm trying to prove to them. And when I know there's nothing to prove, but to let go of suffering, that's the ultimate thing. And many people, they dream a life, not knowing they're living a life of suffering and they get used to and make everything complicated and making everything complicated we can see the easy escape the door is right there to get out but we make it complicated to get out the door because we have to do it a certain way to please and this is where humanity fails we're pleasers yeah i i love this concept and i love like this has inspired me a lot in my life too um it's just something that takes so much time to actually do and to live, right? Like you might understand I'm living in my own dream and it's not, it's just an illusion. It's not the truth. And you might, you have these limiting beliefs, but how do people exit <laughs> that dream? Well, the first thing is awareness. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, my brother talks about this story in, uh, in one of his lectures. There was a day that Oprah Winfrey was having a TV show and her guest was Robert Downey Jr. And by this time, Robert Downey Jr. had gone through so many rehabilitations and Oprah asked him, 
how easy what is to to be re- rehabilitated to get sober and he said very easy with no m- much story and she said how can you say that it was very easy when you went through all these different rehabilitations and it was very simple because when i went through all those rehabilitation centers i did it for somebody else and i kept going to the re- but when i did it for myself it was the easiest thing i do because i knew what i was going to do for myself so it comes a moment that no one knows if we're living in an abusive relationship in a job that we don't want or a life that we don't want, the moment that we realize that that it's not for us, we have two choices. Continue in that dream, making all the excuses, justification, making it complicated, saying it's difficult and things like that. But when you make a decision, you can just walk up and go and let go of all the investment that we have in our own suffering and victimization, the character that we think is truth, but it's no truth. And I tell you, I used to defend the character that I thought that I was, the one that it was not truth, the mm-hmm. one addicted to suffering, I defended it with my teeth until I said, why am I defending my abuser? Mm-hmm. It's like defending someone in a marriage that abuses you and you protect them with your family. No, it's okay. It, it will change. It will change. I promise, you know, just we have to give them time, but it's not changing. There comes a moment when we realize that that dream is not going to change. It's toxic. It's abusive. The thing that we have to do, especially if we have children, Pick our children out and get out the door. Forget what we have. Forget all the belongings. Forget the the investment that we have and just walk out and find our freedom. And then we begin from that moment to go. Yeah. How do you know what is the true you and the, the, the fake you? Well, it is very simple. It's the authentic. The moment that you don't have to please anybody, you don't care to be seen. You're just happy being you. You're not pleasing anybody. And, you know, one of the most beautiful things that I heard lately is my teachers, Tonya Barbara and, and my father, Don Miguel Ruiz, they wrote a book and, uh, in Eros, and, and they say to understand love, first you have to know what love is and what love is not. When you identify yourself as love, you know what makes you happy and what does not. And that's why respect is the highest tool of the artist, of the human, or as the dreamer. Because it reveals itself without, you know, that defending of a lie. You see yourself just as it is. And that's why one of the powerful uh, metaphors out there is the truth will set you free. But free from what? From our own belief system. Yeah. Let's talk about the concept that humans are addicted to suffering. Because I, I think I want people to understand how, how that really works. So can you go deep into that? Well, it is reward and punishment. That's how we get domesticated. Mm -hmm. And some people get domesticated with abuse and fear that they're paralyzing themselves. And then what happens when we grow up is that we begin to abuse ourselves. We begin, you know, being our active domesticator of, you know, of negativity. And that's why, you know, you can see the television having, you know, barbaric scenes and we're just eating eating, watching all that, you know, as we eat food, we're watching these Mm -hmm. things, or we get the heartbreak and we right away look for heartbreak songs to make ourselves feel less than, and then we complain about our life with people. And, you know, and complaining has to do a lot because we master complaining in the addiction of suffering. You know, we complain about our life, but we don't do a, we don't lift a finger. We just stick there because who are we with our, our pain? And they say that to have love, you have to have pain first. And, you know, we believe that. So we go through all these trails and now it comes for the biggest, you know, abuser. That's one of the religions, not the true heart religion of the heart of the divinity, but the man manipulating, you know, suppressing that automatic coldness of machismo that I call that is never going to be enough. That is a factory of, you know, falling messengers. And the message that is falling is to hurt one another, to go a war against one another. And then it became the war of the gods. And the war of the god is not necessary with Zeus or Quetzalcoatl, you know. It's with humanity, who is right, who is wrong. And they fight to the death. And even families, you know, with politics, with, you know, sports, with, you know, anything, they begin agitating themselves and using the word against themselves. And you can see right there, there's no respect for one another because we all are different. We all enjoy the same thing. We don't have to prove ourselves from other things. So when we begin now hurting people to hurt ourselves, that is the addiction of suffering, and it changes a lot. You know, I see many cultures say that they love Divine Mother, but, you know, this, for me, my physical body, even though I'm male, this is part of the planet. This is Divine Mother. 
And many people say that they love Divine Mother, but they treat Divine Mother horribly by believing in lies. And, you know, the moment that we begin freeing ourselves from ourselves and we have to, that minimal potential, minimal opportunity to have that reflection to change our life, we have two choices. We continue, you know, the nightmare, or we change our dream because we can change our life when we want to. But the thing is about detaching. And that's what many people cannot do in addiction, no matter what kind of addiction it is. When they're not ready, they cannot let the addiction go. But when something happens and say, okay, I want to see again. And it's when I was blind, but I wasn't talking about seeing with my eyes. I was seeing with my heart, I wanna live again. So from that point on, I begin seeing my own life like an autopsy. Now seeing where I lost power the lies that I defended. And it's difficult because it's, it hurts, but an operation also hurts. And to recover, it takes time. But when time gives you that healing, and this is when many people are in a hurry or they want another operator, a doctor to operate them, when you are the one who should do the operation. Yeah. Do you believe that there has to be pain and suffering in the world for us to understand love? Or do you believe that we can all heal and there could be a world where there's the, no addiction to suffering? I believe that it could be a world with no addiction to suffering, but our ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors created suffering and get manipulated by the suggestion of the word or what should be, especially, you know, the dream of hell and heaven, which for me is not real. Heaven and hell is not after we die, it's in this life. Yeah. That's why it's important to know the two masteries of what is real, life and death. When you know life and death, it is the only reality and not the language and the knowledge because that's what people are attached to and afraid to let go. Just think about it. It's scary to think that we're not gonna think all the time, that one day we're not gonna have this interaction of speaking to one or being present. So people begin fearing that, that they can believe any lies to keep them, including I've seen times that people go to different traditions and they say, you know, no matter what you do right now, you pray, you do things, you're paying for the lifetime of the past today and your next life will be better. And you know, that, that's a manipulation there right too, because there is no past life. There's energy, yes, but there is no Jose that was before this Jose and there will be not a Jose after I die. Mm -hmm. That is something like a bandage to, to people who are afraid of dying. And if one people is afraid of dying, then here comes a religion, here comes a belief system. And people run away from one to another, not realizing they are in the war of the gods. But when you surrender, you like all the religions because you respect them all. And you see the gems in all of them and you're not debating anything because you're just here visiting the dream of humanity. Because like one of my favorite things that I like about the Four Agreements is the story that one says, Imagine you're the only sober person in a world where everybody's completely drunk. Why waste your time talking to the yeah. drunk people? Yeah. But you enjoy them. Mm. If you have family and friends who live like that, they're still alive, you enjoy them. But I do a little met a little metaphor for myself. I imagine that I have a scuba, a scuba gear and an oxygen tank. And if they start talking about negative or politics or anything, you know, that gives me, you know, reacting. I said, okay, my oxygen tank is getting low. I have to get out of the water and breathe again to my own dream. And this yeah. is something that we all have, our own dream. Yeah, that, that was something I was going to ask you because even though you're healing yourself, it's hard to interact and live in a world that still has so much suffering. You see all the wars, you see the news, you see, it, it's, it's hard not to get sucked into the fear and the negative emotions. So how do you protect yourself and how do you he heal yourself in this environment is be present and see that's happening but not lose ourselves in the reaction in the reaction when we get upset or mad we don't see clearly anymore and a side has gotten us to fight another side but if we think from the point of view that everybody's our children just imagine that your two kids are fighting but they're fighting for something that is pointless you love them both and sometimes they don't see that but little by little by seeing your presence that is contagious, that is not fighting, that is peaceful, there will see something inside of you. And when they're ready, spinning their wheels, fighting, they know that it doesn't go anywhere. They will ask the question, is there more than life than this? 
then the authentic self is so contagious that, you know, like reading a good book, like the Four Agreements, I, I, I know this information because it's integrity talking to integrity, but this makes me feel better living this way of life instead of living by the art of war. Mm-hmm. Because in the art of war, it's always fighting, always wanting to be right, always debating. But in the other dream, you can just have peace. You know, I've talked to the most nicest racist because I would respect I can have a conversation, even though I know where they see me. But for me, it doesn't matter. I'm just stepping into a belief that I know is not real for me. And then I go to another belief, another belief, and all these people can go against each other. But when you enter them with respect, they speak to you. And this is something that, you know, this world lacks of respect, especially imagine there's all these artists that disrespect themselves, which is the best. Well, there's no better or worse. It's just art. Yeah. So you're saying that you keep coming to this concept of respect. You think all we need to do is to respect each other and that we could be more peaceful that way. Well, yes, because let's imagine we respect ourselves. Like, let, I respect myself that this is not the marriage for me. In that moment, I would take a part of big suffering in my life and make peace with myself and bring that peace to me. And that's with everything. When we begin respecting ourselves, it's like pouring the cup in the glass and the respect will just build up because yeah. that's where we live. But if we don't respect ourselves, we cannot respect other people because something that they do, they may trigger us. And we have to defend in order to be right. But when you respect yourself, you don't care to be right or wrong. Even I say to my father, is it strange? I love to be judged. And he laughed. Why? It's because when I judge, I feel it taking it personally, but I don't believe it. But I can create a new story to share. A new chapter for a new book. Mm. Because a revelation of someone who's sick with addiction or suffering is inspiring me to make some medicine in my heart, in my words, to create a story that will reflect to that person or another person what does dance do. Hey everyone, during back to school season, keeping up with healthy eating can be a challenge, but Green Chef is here to make it simple and delicious. Thanks to Green Chef for sponsoring today's podcast. I've been cooking more at home lately and I love the convenience and ease of Green Chef. Green Chef makes it easy to stick to your healthy eating habits with a flexible menu featuring over 35 customizable recipe options every week. My recent favorite meal was their guacamole chicken and kale salad. It was so easy and quick to make, but tasted so good. Did you know that Green Chef is the first certified organic meal kit company? That means each box is packed with the freshest organic produce and premium proteins delivered right to your doorstep. Plus, they make it easy with meals that are ready to whip up in just 25 minutes. And if you didn't know, Green Chef is part of the HelloFresh family, which means they bring a wide array of meal plans catered to your clean eating habits. As someone who's enjoyed HelloFresh in the past, I really enjoy Green Chef. Now, get ready for this amazing offer. Go to greenchef.com slash TLL class for 50% off your first box plus 50 free credits with ClassPass. That's code TLL class at greenchef.com slash TLL class to get 50% off your first box and 50 free ClassPass credits. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Don't miss out on this deal. Why don't we go through all the agreements, like the four agreements and the fifth agreement? Because I, I well, the four agreements is one of my favorite books of all time. I have read the fifth agreement as well, which is really good. So for the listeners, let, let's just give them your summary <laughs> of them. Yes. Well, the first of one is to be in pickle with your word. And what does that mean? It's like the magic wand. Word creates stories. Let's say I say a dream. I make an intent. And with that, with that word, I can create a story for myself. I'm going to school. I'm going to learn this. I'm going to go to a public place and speak from the heart. And, you know, I create a belief system of what I want to do. And that creates now knowing if I'm using the word against myself, which when I'm not in pick up my word saying, I'm not good. I'm not doing my best. Why even try? You begin using your word like magic instead of being a scorpion singing so with his own tail, you know, poisoning itself, you use the word to lift up, to raise your intent, and to make what is not possible, possible. Mm-hmm. And the second agreement, do not take things personal, which was one of the hardest for me because I took myself personal all the time. But the moment that I begin not taking myself personal and respecting my way of thinking, I begin seeing other people, especially the people who scream at me, who are negative at me, you know, instead of fighting them back, 
I just tell them, you know, these people, you're asking for help, but they do not know how to ask for help because they're blinded by hate and anger in that moment because that creates a hangover. Let's say they do something evil, they do something negative to people they love. The next day they will wake up with resentment or I mean, regret, I mean, with regret and the other one to do it again. And this is what happens in relationships. They hurt people and then I never do it again and they hurt people. But the moment that you don't take things personal, you begin cleaning your space because no one has the right to, you know, say those things to you and you don't have the right to say that back to them. So in that moment, you clean your space, not taking anything personal, like just like Siddhartha did when they threw the arrows, Mara threw the arrows, the fire ones, and he turned them into roses. He turned all those opinions, all the judgment, because he didn't believe in them. Then even if they don't feel them, of course we feel that we begin protecting ourselves from ourselves with this dance. And here comes the other one, do not make assumptions. Do not project what other people do without asking them the question of what they're feeling, because in the addiction of suffering, even if they laugh, they think they're laughing at us, but they're not laughing at us. But we make the assumption they're laughing at us. So imagine what we do when people say things or make opinions. We make assumption, oh, look at me, they're hurting me. And then we are afraid to speak with word. When we don't make assumptions, we give respect to other people to create their own art and things like that. And when we want to, okay, let's have a conversation. Did you mean this and that? And they will say no or yes. You know, that clears the space. Mm -hmm. And this is the important thing that we respect one another in relationships or in friendships. We have the opportunity to conversate and clean this these space. And many people are afraid, are nervous. You know, they prefer gossip than actually speak do you say this to me? You know, they prefer, it's not inviting words. It's just like to clean the space because you want people in your life. And for some people, you don't care to have that conversation because if they did it once, you know, you don't have that investment to have them in your life. So, you know, you choose. Now it comes the fourth one. Is my father's favorite ag agreement. Why? Because without the fourth one, none of them will exist. And he's always doing your best. And for me, when I do my best, how can I judge myself? How can I say I didn't do enough when I gave it my best? And this is one of the important things to do in life. When we do our best, like when we're 20, sometimes we judge ourselves. Oh, I wish I was 20 so I can change everything. No, when I was 20, I did my best in that time. And 25, I did my best. Now, 20 years later, I'm doing my best in 45. And that's all I could do. Yeah. And uh, the fifth agreement, you know, that was very special for me because when my father was in the, in, in the hospital, before he went to a nine-week coma, I asked him, what's the best way that I can repay you? And, and he said, you know, take care of my son, you know, and uh, be skeptical, but learn to listen. And from that point on, he went to a nine-week coma. At first, I thought I was being skeptical of the outside, you know, opinions and things like that. But no, the fifth agreement is to be skeptical of my own negativity, to be skeptical of my own poison. Let's say, I cannot do this interview. I cannot, you know, make a book. You know, if I'm skeptical to that, then I give myself the permission to make an interview, to write a book. Yeah. So it comes a moment that we're skeptical of our own poison. And when we do that, practice makes him master. And we're mastering ourselves, not other people. We're mastering our own voice of knowledge to not use it against ourselves, which goes back to the first agreement, to be impeccable with our work. And then from this on, there's nothing to do. There's just to enjoy life and recreate our dream, recreate our life how we want to. That's why sometimes we pass through two marriages or, you know, 40 years, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. We have to experience life to see what gives us pleasure or what does not, because it doesn't have to do with religion either or mystery school spirituality. It's just about life. It's about common sense. And when you wake up that artist inside of you, then you drop what we call in the Totec tradition, the human form is what we believe we are. Like for many people, I am Jose, but I know that there's just a name given to me in my story. And I don't even believe my story. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about like the, a lot of the agreements, like be impeccable with your word and then the be skeptical, but learn to listen. A lot of them seem like you have the ability to like become something that you're not. Like some people are, you know, some people are so deep into the illusion that do you believe you have to be 
true? Like you have to tell your word yourself words that are true, or do you tell yourself words that are really good that don't feel true so that you grow to something better? <laughs> you know, like people call it manifesting or being delusional. <laughs> well, the thing is intent. Okay. You know, like I move my hand. Yeah. What made it move my hand? Well, I give an order to my brain to move my hand. But what gave an order to my brain to give an order to my hand is intent. Mm -hmm. It's when you know. And when you're swimming in the world of knowledge and words, you know, it, it comes a moment that all we have to do is keep our conscious clean. If we keep our conscious clean, we're free. But if we betray our consciousness, then guilt, shame, and all the other aspects of emotions that get used by the word begins hurting ourselves. That's why the word warrior exists in the Toltec tradition, because we become a warrior not to fight the outside, but to unlearn all these things that make us not enjoy our life. And there's a lot of manipulation. There's a lot of fanatism, superstition out there in shamanism, in spirituality, and all of those that create stories to not grow, but to hide behind them. And when people behind them, you know, like everybody wants to be the Buddha without making the Buddha's work or walking the path of the Buddha or going through the, the unlearning. They just want the perfect image yep. so they can see. And then in the time of now, people are copying everybody to write the books. You know, they go into people's, you know, um, videos and, 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 and just copy them and, you know, become parrots. But they don't understand. And this is the corruption of spirituality that's been happening for 3,000 years. And it's because of search for power. And the search for power is what makes the humanity lose themselves. That's why I like the word strength. When we find our own strength to go through all our emotions, we clean up our consciousness. And this is when I really feel that our dream is separate from other people because we know that we're dreaming our own dream and we're owning what works for us and what doesn't work for us. Because imagine Robert Downey Jr. It didn't recover when he wanted to do it for other people with guilt and shame. But when he was tired of using, you know, drugs and alcohol, it was the easiest decision he made because he didn't want that in his life anymore. And it comes a moment in our life when we say, I don't want to be in this toxic relationship. I don't want to be in these things. And of course, we make it complicated because we don't want to change or we fear to change. We fear to take the action. But I tell you, when you are ready, you know, you have your intent behind you and you will free yourself. And then you wake up in a room where everybody's completely drunk and you're the only sober person. But it doesn't stop you from, you know, from enjoying life. Even there's negativity. You know, there's just children playing with knowledge instead of with toys. Mm. Okay, there was something else you said earlier about how everyone co goes to this moment where they're like, I can't live like this anymore. There must be more to life. So, and, and that that you say is like the beginning of the awakening point. So I've felt that in my life and I'm sure our listeners have felt that in their life as well. But I guess what would be the next steps after that <laughs> to start living authentically? <laughs> yeah, the first thing is to be aware of what makes us toxic. Mm. Not to other people, but to ourselves in our own dream and how we use the words to create that big victim that keeps on going forever. You know, something did happen to us at one point, but it's not happening anymore. And to let that go, we have to really appreciate life. Now, being aware of it is the metaphor of the garden. The garden will need work every day, not just one time. So the mind begins working and being exposed to life and not being afraid of life. But we begin now filtering the toxic parts that we use against ourselves, And sometimes memories come without warning. You know, something might happen to us that we see on television and bring back the triggers, but we know that's happening. So we have to unhook ourselves right away from the point of view of the victim and be the point of view of gratitude that we're not there anymore. And when you have the point of view of gratitude is that you really appreciate every moment that you have because the biggest currency is not money, it's time and how we spend it. So we spend our currency hurting ourselves. We invest in hurting ourselves. But when you say, I don't want to invest in this anymore, then the stock market of hurting yourself goes down. And the stock market of you know putting investment in the better part of you begins to grow because your attention now is seeing what makes you inspired. And this is why I say Totec are artists because we follow inspiration. 
Mm-hmm. We don't live like in the same dream all the time. We always want a challenge to express and experience. And when we express and experience, we have even more. Like if you talk to many minds, instead of just talking to one mind, then you have many minds, points of view that you can, you know, use the words and play with one another, learn from one another, inspire one another to create the next art that we're ready to create. Yeah. How do you decide what you want to create with your life? Do you just take it, you follow your inspiration day by day, or do you have a vision? I I guess, tell us your process. Well, it's a vision without expectation. Okay. You have an intent, you want to experience something, but you're open to whatever. You're not like, I have to do it this way. No, no. It's not clear. It's just an intent, right? Open intention. It's like wherever, wherever it takes you, know, you know, like you make a podcast, I don't know who I'm going to interview. I'm just going to let it go, see what happens to it. Because if I have a structure, you know, I will not see out the window. I'm just going to go direct. Yeah. But when you begin a point A to go to point C, you know, there's so many directions where life can take you where you mm-hmm. have no expectation that you are going to taste. But the following the inspiration, listening to your physical body is one of the main things. Because your physical body tells you fear, tells you excitement, tells mm-hmm. you everything that your body becomes your ally. And now you're being alive. It's like my puppy, you know, if I'm taking him to the everyday, it's not that, you know, he knows every day, he knows the routine. But the moment that I take him to a different city that he's never been in or a different people that he's never met, his attention wakes up differently yeah. because he's drinking life. So yeah. the same thing with us humans. Yeah. We're just like a puppy. <laughs> and uh, the moment that we break that, that thing, how we should do it and how not to do it, we become free to create, to co-create with life instead of co-creating just with our mind. Yeah, that's beautiful. It also reminds me how even humans, when we travel and we're not in our routine and our environment, we we feel more alive and inspired. Anything can happen. (laughs) But when we're in our normal home, it's like your brain is set to do certain things. You, you're you you're living in a, a box, kind of. Yes, I, I, I call it the automatic machine. Because exactly. <laughs> the city will get you, the city will get you. But yeah, like when you travel, like when I travel to many places, I'm like, I want to live here. I want to live here. I want to <laughs> spend time here, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree because that's inspiration. Yeah, and yeah. It, and it gives you strength to go back to create and, and let go of what doesn't work in our homes anymore. Yeah, I already feel your energy. Like you just have such good energy and you're just so like, there's no expectations. It's just fun. (laughs) Yes. And I I aim to live that way too. (laughs) That's the thing because, you know, sometimes we take the search so seriously. Yeah. That we don't, you know, that we already written the book of what we're going to expect. But the moment that we don't take life that seriously, that we're just like, you know, too old to grow up. You're like my father likes to say, you know, that we just became these children with awareness knowing what worked, it didn't work, but our heart will continue open to the the last day. And this is one thing that I really say to myself. I want to live the rest of my life after speaking the language of, you know, the victim, after, you know, searching and then done searching. I just want to finish my soup in peace, meaning my soup is the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I've gone through relationships, drama and all that and sacrifice and, 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 you know, pleasing and all that until the moment says, you know, this... It's the love of my life. Mm-hmm. And this needs to live life too. Everything that I've worked so hard for like 20 something years to unlearn is for me to enjoy life. Yeah, that's beautiful. And what are we waiting for? For permission, validation for somebody else, for a teacher, you know, that, you know, how, like some sportsman says, before that person trains me, I want to know what's in the refriger- in their refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we cannot give what we don't have. Yeah. I'm thinking of all the people listening who they might be inspired by what you say, but they they still care so much about like what their parents want them to do, or they care about the, what their peers think of them. How do you encourage them to let that go? Well, don't gossip about themselves. Like I don't gossip about anything I want to do because I know there's maybe some haters out there that yeah. gonna use whatever I say to sabotage me. And then I surprise. I don't oh, have to announce things. Okay. If I'm like this, I just I'm like this. I don't have to say I'm gonna be like this. No. Oh, so don't you don't even have to announce. <laughs> I own the art that I create, and I'm like the art gallery. No one's gonna see my paintings until I open that door and my premiere happens. Oh, okay. And sometimes when we change, we change already. And sometimes even when we change. People will see 
what they want to see. Exactly. You know, like I like before I was vegan, they judged me for not being vegan. And now that I'm vegan, they judge me for being vegan. <laughs> and it's in everything. People would just judge. <laughs> yep. Especially when they see someone happy. Yeah, yeah. So you just have to learn to not show them. You don't have to sh tell them. You don't have to prove to them anything, right? Yes. It's the second agreement. Don't take things personal. It's not about you. It's about them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jose, I want to know about your lifestyle. Like, I, you seem so free-spirited, but you're, I guess, what are some things that you do, whether it's every day or every week, to keep you on this authentic path? I love to follow my inspiration. And my inspiration always been music, meditation, fashion, and uh, and creating. And I follow those things, and especially fashion. I love to say, how is mother going to express herself today? So I get all this clothing and I dress up like if I was doing puja. Yeah. And, and that inspires me to feel like my puppy when he gets groomed. You know, I walk out, I feel <laughs> nice, you know. <laughs> and, so and then from there, I find inspiration to create voice words. And, uh, and that's why when I please my puppy, when I please my physical body, I feel happy that in that moment, the authenticity comes out that I can identify where I belong and do not belong. That's why, like I said earlier, if I'm going to meet a group of people that I love, but they have a lot of judgment and opinions, I imagine that I have a scuba gear, mm -hmm. oxygen tank, yeah. and I go visit them, held their hand, but the moment that is getting intense, I remove myself because I honor my space. I don't let nobody abuse my puppy anymore. And that includes me. That's beautiful. So it's like you allow yourself to express yourself fully, knowing that not everyone will like it or agree, but you just have to protect yourself. Yes, because, you know, life, we will end one day. Yeah. So what am I waiting for to be, you know, sacrificing myself for judgment and opinions? You know, and sometimes the people who judge is the people who want to do it too. Yeah. And then when you do it freely, express yourself however you want to express, it's contagious that somebody will begin expressing themselves too. Mm -hmm. Breaking the ice. Yes, I love that. I, and I think it tells you a lot about, it'll make some people mad, but it will also inspire other people. Yes. And that's out of your control. You know, I just, I just say to some of my friends that I'm going to change, you know, my, uh, my, my, life, my delivery in the future, that I'm going to go more into storytelling more than, than just lecturing and teaching like that. I just want to let the spirit flow because, you know, I, I thought corruption is spirituality and I just want to take that out. I want to challenge myself to deliver in a different way. And of course, somebody, you know, got offended and they're talking about themselves. No, I do this, I do this, I do this. But I said, I wasn't talking about you with respect. Yeah. This is the path that I will do. So sometimes yeah. the things that we're going to do, some people might use it to hurt themselves with. Yes. But it has nothing to do with us. Yes. And this is when we don't sacrifice our point of view. Then later we cross Mm -hmm. And then they see, oh, it can be done. Mm. It can be done. I don't have to be, you know, this this way of living. And it reminded me of when I had three puppies like a, like 15 years ago. Uh, and they just had a baby. So the two puppies, the older ones, the mother and father, they they they, they knew the, the little cradle, you know, where they they uh, they stay to get mm -hmm. potty trained. But the new puppy, you know, didn't know nothing about the cradle and nothing about the wall. So we put them in, in the little corner. We put a little a little wall separator from, for them not to leave that. The two other puppies who were domesticated didn't dare, you know, to touch that wall. But the one who wasn't domesticated, he just wanted to come to us. It pushed, 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 that he pushed the gate down and he crossed it with no, <laughs> and came to us. But the other ones, they were domesticated to not cross that. They put one paw, they look at each other, they put another paw. And when they know that it was okay to cross that, they came to us, but they were slower because of their programming mind they had. Yes. And let's say I was like the parents of the puppy. And I see my teachers without that, just breaking the wall that little by little, I begin to unlearn that. Yeah. We're all like the domesticated adult puppies that we need to feel where the lines are and test. <laughs> yes. And that's the addiction of suffering wall. Yeah. It, it, it stops us from being our true selves. And if you stop a puppy from being a puppy, it's going to get sad and depressed. And this is exactly what's happening to humans. We humans just love unconditionally, that they teach us to love conditionally. Yeah. 
And that hurts. That's a painful thing for our physical body because we're meant to love everything and everyone. I see. Um, do you have any tips to help people unlearn faster? Because <laughs> a lot of people are very slow and cautious. And is, is there any faster way to do it? Well, there is no fast way. It's just a way. Okay, what's the way? And that's respecting yourself and unlearning how you treat your puppy in, in your mind. Yeah. And one thing that I, I share to my friends is to get a recording device, press record and speak from the heart. Instead of speaking, okay, complain to somebody, Record your complaints, record record your happy moments, and then you begin seeing your message. Now, if you like your message that you give to yourself, you can change it or continue with it. But most of all, when you see when one our message is about complaining, we cannot do, we can change it. One begins questioning it. Can we really do it? You know, can we do we, I really believe this? No, I don't believe it. And when you record your full potential, the message of power, of straightening, you know, the moment that you believe in yourself. And you hear that message when you are in difficult times, when you just get a heartbreak or something, you hear your own voice and you say, this is the real me. I'm just stuck in a moment that, you know, I cannot get out of right now. So your own voice, your own teacher voice is the one you're going to learn from, not another human, because you can resist, fight another human. But when you listen to yourself, your experiences, you know what's going on. Like I said earlier, I know what makes Jose happy, and I know what makes Jose suffer. How do I know this? Because I am Jose. Exactly, everybody is you. So when you record this, you will begin to unlearn your belief system. But this recording is not for anybody else's ear. It's for your own. Because this is the moment that you're returning to your consciousness. Now when you betray your consciousness, you know, you're going to hear it loud. And when I say I'm not sorry to say this. Uh, once you wake up, you cannot go back to sleep. But you begin now waking up to unlearn so you can serve the love of your life that it is your true self. Yeah. So that do us part, like a marriage. So beautiful. Wow, I, I'm definitely going to try that. That's. It, it already sounds like such an impactful exercise, like to speak from the heart and to give yourself that that love and respect. Yes, and another thing, you know, without words... When someone's going through hard times, I invite anybody to, without words just to grab your hand and put it in your cheek and close your eyes and feel your own love. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we have no awareness that we can do that. We're expecting love from outside. But when we feel our own love, you know, we find our ally and the ally is ourselves. Beautiful. So I know your brother is also sharing this wisdom. So oh, yeah. are you guys very close? And how do you see you? <laughs> I guess, <laughs> how, I don't know. How, how is your dynamic in continuing to share this wisdom? I just want to hear about your relationship with your brother. Yeah, well, me and my brother are super close. Great. You know, we come from the same uh, three years apart. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I will tell you one thing that grandma told us. He says, in order to keep the Totec tradition alive, you have to learn from your mistakes and and overcome them and create your own path. If you copy me and your dad, you're killing the Toltec tradition mm. because life continues on and to grow. We yeah. cannot stay in the past. So my brother, he loves knowledge. He's very intellectual that he got trained by my father, Dr. Miguel Reese. And he, that's the way he delivers, that's the way he learned. And I got teach by Chaman Miguel Reese. So I love nature, I love ceremony, and I love, you know, the music. So I got trained. So when we get together, we share our own experience of what gives us pleasure in life. And, and we also talk with the same torch that we have that gives us happiness, how we overcome what doesn't give us happiness. Mm. And when we get together, we continue, you know, merging that to the people. We share the mind and the spirit. But, uh, but it's beautiful to get the opportunity to, to work with my brother because we're, we're both different, but we deliver the same message in different ways. Yeah. But the best part is when we tour together, you know, he leaves his family home. I leave my family home. And then we are in a car like we were teenagers and sitting to the Pesh Mode and 1990s music. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. Yeah, I, I love hearing how you, it's not about copying your father or, or anyone before you. Everybody can deliver this message through their own unique way. Yeah. And that's the magic about there, because right nowadays, you know, people are copying each other's book, especially known authors. You know, they're taking young authors that are barely known and 
switch the information instead of supporting them. And in this work of spirituality or any kind of arts, we're here to support one another. You know, especially in the traditions, you know, we're here to support Mother Earth. And, uh, you know, the, the women are the portal of the infinite home. In our tradition, we were here to support the feminine dream because this is, you know, how life blossoms. If you just support the, the male dream, the machismo dream, the life will end. So we're here to support the divine feminine. And before my grandmother passed away, she said, you know, like a, probably like 12 years ago, she said, I'm very happy for the generations that will see the return of the divine mother. But it's not like Mother Mary or Guadalupe or Tonatzin is going to come. It's going to be the movement of the respect for the female dream. And it's going to come back. And, you know, it's happening right now. And that's one of the most beautiful things. Yeah. Even males are, you know, grasping into this and bothering in this. And it's that we all coming to the point that we're going to serve the planet, beginning with ourselves and continuing with the dance that we do in life. So so when you say divine feminine, you do you just mean like, like, can you define that a little bit? What do you mean by? The giver of life. Ah. Uh... It begins with the planet. It gave life. This, we think that we are, you know, the body is just a planet. We're the energy that's inside the planet. We're not the knowledge. The knowledge is the illusion that humans created. A story. Animals don't live by the story of the word. They just live in nature. And this is what we're here to do. Embrace our nature. Embrace the feminine, the feminine divinity. Embrace the planet. But being aware that we're the energy who uses knowledge instead of knowledge using us. Mm, yes. So beautiful. Okay, Jose, is there a final message that you want to leave with our listeners today? Just knowing that our life is a dream. And if we don't like our dream, we can change it. And we can change it because we're here in life to make a masterpiece of art with our life. Now the choice is ours. We can be, you know, like a <laughs> bad bacteria or we can be good bacteria like a good kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> the choice is us. Yes. But whatever dance we made is going to lead us to consciousness. Like Abraham Lincoln said, if we do bad, we're going to feel bad. But if we do good, we're going to feel good. And just imagine doing good acts to the love of your life and to your family and friends. You'll be enriched and your consciousness will be clean. Like the Egyptians say, in order to enter heaven, your heart must be light as a feather. If your heart is not light as a feather, you may never enter heaven. And of course, it's about the heavy heart is a dirty consciousness. But the heart that is light as a feather is a consciousness that is clean. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay, lastly, where can we find you online? Well, you can find us on my father's page, miguelriz.com. That's what everything we're doing and uh, the tours. And I like to do an Instagram only. I like to share art, poems. Um, music, whatever comes in my mind in the moment, I do. Sometimes I stop for a while, but then sometimes I get inspired and go there again to share art. So yeah. on Instagram, Don Jose Ruiz, you can find my different types of my art. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jose, for sharing your wisdom today. It was truly so beautiful. And also your energy is so beautiful. Oh, and same way, sister. Thank you so much for inviting me. And to all the listeners, thank you for having the time to listen to us because this is the most important time, how we spend our time. Thank you again. Thank you.